do you get for your money when you buy a bike? Because some bikes can be really quite cheap, whereas others can be really, really expensive. But how much better are they? Because after all, you are the one providing the engine. We've looked into this before with road bikes and found that the difference between a cheap road bike and a top of the range super bike is actually pretty big. But the difference between a mid range road bike and a top of the range super bike is much smaller. And that's because bikes that cost around a thousand pounds, euros, or dollars are really, really good. But what happens when you go off road on gravel? If you spend more money, can you go faster? Can you go further? But also, does it limit what you can ride? And does it limit where you can ride? Now I have a sneaking suspicion that a gravel bike might just be the best value type of bike out there with less separating the super bikes from the mid-range bikes than any other. And yes, of course, weight still plays a part off-road as does aerodynamics too, when the speed is high enough. Yeah, but are there other factors as well that can make a difference? Well, in a bid to try and find out, we've managed to get our hands on two awesome bikes, the Canyon Grail 6 and the Canyon Grail CF SLX 8 Di2. Yeah, so we're filming this with Shimano. As you'll see, both these bikes have Shimano's GRX gravel specific group sets on there. So as part of our look at what separates these two bikes, we're also gonna do a deep dive into the gears and the brakes. Now we've done this before, Ollie, when we looked at 105 versus mechanical durace. And in that instance, the difference was not very much. So I'm gonna be really intrigued to find out today's results. How are we going to find out? Well, previously when doing these kinds of comparison videos, we've ridden short and exceedingly painful time trials. And in this video, we're gonna keep doing that. However, to try and answer the questions of what and where you can ride, we might have a couple of other little tests up our sleeves. Test number one is our speed test. A tough little gravel climb to start, followed by a fast gravel section, then onto the road. Does anything separate these bikes when they're going quickly? Well, according to the Wahoo side, this is the start of the course that you've designed. Yeah, just through there. That's a hedge. It opens out a little bit afterwards. There's, there's gravel, Ollie. This is, this is gravel riding. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. All right. Beep, 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 beep. God. Oh, damn it. Oh. Good luck, mate. Thanks. Oh. Bit moist mm. under, under gravel. Tire. It's no it, gravel here. It's a it's a max effort, Ollie. Right, so whilst Ollie is out getting his first time on the scoreboard, I thought I'd take the opportunity to start talking through some of the differences between the bikes before we actually see what those differences might be out on the road and the trail. So I'm gonna start with the big one, the handlebars. No, I'm only kidding. Handlebars are clearly very different, but no, the big one for me is the frame material. So this, the CF SLX, our superbike, is made out of carbon fiber, whereas the Grail 6 is made out of aluminium, as mid-range bikes typically are. Now that has a big effect on the weight. So the frame here is just 830 grams, whereas our Grail 6 has a frame weight of 1,540 grams, so almost twice the weight. But then whilst that's significant, so too are the material properties in terms of stiffness and compliance. So carbon fiber can be engineered in a way that gives it real stiffness in one direction for power transfer and good handling, but then also allows you to engineer in a degree of flex on another plane. Now you can see it most clearly actually up at the seat post here where it will flex significantly in that direction, boosting comfort, but yet it's really stiff in that direction so that you can actually pedal on the thing. Now, of course, aluminium does deflect, 
course it does, but much, much less. What's going to be interesting, though, is to see whether or not we can actually time a difference between the two. Certainly on a normal gravel trail with average size bumps, 40 millimeter tires here with about 34 PSI in, you can feel the difference between the bikes. But could you actually measure a difference? Could you go faster with more compliance built into your frame? We're going to find out shortly. Before we damn aluminium too much though, it does have its advantages, not least the fact that it's on bikes that don't cost as much. The other thing is that it can, and in this instance is according to Canyon, slightly more robust. So it's a little bit less susceptible to accidental knocks and dings. So you don't need to take quite such good care of your mid-range bike as you would do your superbike. Right, run number one, superbike, coming up. Now, neither of these bikes promises to offer any aero advantage, although the Superbike does have aero wheels, which hopefully will give some slight benefit. But in a road situation like this, by far the biggest things are the rolling resistance of the tires and also the position of you, the rider, that you can get into. And on that last point, the position on both of the bikes is pretty much identical. Both have a nice long top tube and a short stem, which means that you can have both nice stable handling when you need it, but also short, nimble, agile handling when you're off-road and navigating the rough stuff. And you're still able to get into a nice aero position with your elbows bent and you can tuck your head in and go faster when you need to. And while I appreciate Many gravel riders probably aren't that bothered about aero. I mean, you can still go faster for the same effort when you want it and be more efficient and, well, potentially go further for the same effort as well. Right, Ollie? Yeah. Run number two. Yeah, I'm excited about this one. Good stuff, mate. Look after it. No what? falling off. Okay. <laughs> right, ready? Yeah. Beep. 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 Oh, let's go into the hedge again. For God's sake. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know why, but every time I get on a bike that Ollie's been riding, I have to put it in the big ring again. Weird. Right, you ready? <laughs> Low blow, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna go now. That was loads of fun. Let's see where Sai is, see how he gets on. Whew. <sighs> Hear me, first impressions, Ollie. I didn't think I didn't think I was gonna notice much of a difference, but I felt it was actually like pretty big. Pretty big difference between these two. Yeah. I felt like felt like that one was so much smoother. Yes. Like, like I know for a fact that the tires are the same pressure because I pumped them up myself. Same tires as well. Same tires, but it feels like it's kind of got, it's like a magic carpet in comparison. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's got full like suspension going on or anything, but it is it, noticeably when you're on that like, really rough stuff, more compliant. And then on the road as well, even on like the sort of slightly imperfect tarmac, it, it noticeably just more plush. Yeah, um, ride. That's, that's weirded me out actually. Me. Yeah, yeah, it's been that significant. Also, the weight on that I think was noticeable, or the lack of. Yeah. So the weight difference in these two bikes, right? 1.2 kilograms, which is quite a lot. I mean, that's you know more than a, a bag of sugar. Um, yeah. And if you so we did some maths. I said did some maths. Stuck it on an internet online calculator, but apparently. That 1.2 kilos is worth about 40 seconds up Alp d'Huez, which is always my kind of like standard time. <laughs> now we've not ridden that up anywhere near Alp d'Huez, but I think off-road, a difference in weight, because you're not riding at a constant speed, you're constantly changing 
your pace, especially yeah. on like slower technical stuff, I think a lighter bike feels more responsive. Yes, isn't it? on that initial section on this test loop you've created, there was at the very least a, per a perception that I felt I could feel the, the, the lower weight immediately. How much difference it made, might not, it might have been like a second or two, but it, you, it's definitely perceptible. Well, let's find out. The results for our four kilometer mixed surface loop are as follows. On the aluminium grail, I completed the course in 13 minutes, five seconds, and sided it in 12.45. Switching to the lighter carbon bike with greater compliance, we were both quicker. I managed the course in 12.41 and Sai 12.37. Test number two now is going to be a little bit more technical. So we've got a kind of bumpy-ish climb up through the woods here. And then we've got a really nice single track descent, relatively simple, but with a fair few rocks and roots thrown in. And it's slippy out today, isn't it? It's been a little bit damp um, and it's going to get more damp because there's a small stream crossing as well. So uh, yeah, it's going to be good. All right, you can go first. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Shall I do my own bleeps? Beep, beep, oh, I thought beep. that was a long one then. <laughs> he False cheated, start. so that doesn't count because he jumped the jumped the start. <laughs> it's time for my run now. Pray for Ollie. More technical riding requires greater control of the bike, and this is gonna put a bigger demand on the braking and the shifting. So let's talk about the components that are fitted to the two bikes, starting with the similarities. Now, despite the difference in price, both bikes are fitted with hydraulic disc brakes. And I think this is just incredibly important. Hydraulic disc brakes, they offer great modulation, more power, and more consistency over cable actuated disc brakes. Also, cable actuated disc brakes, you can be more prone to cable stretch and things like that. Both the bikes have 11 speed cassettes with a nice wide ratio on there, and they both have two chain rings up front. Although, you can swap this out on both bikes for a single one by chain ring setup if required or if that's what you want. And that's because the rear mechs, the GRX rear mechs that are on both are compatible with one by setups and they feature this clutch mechanism which you can turn on and off. And the clutch helps keep the chain nice and tight on the rough stuff and stops it slapping into the chain stay. Both pairs of levers on the bikes have been adapted from Shimano's road group sets to better suit the demands of mixed surface riding. You've got a wider lever blade here, and also the pivot point on the lever is different too, so it can give you greater leverage when you're braking from a hoods position like that. And just the overall shifting on the bike should be very similar because the ramps uh, on both the chain set and the cassette are engineered to be the same shape. So we should have nice smooth shifting on both the, uh, well, less expensive bike and the super bike.
So Ollie has just taken you through a long list of similarities, but there are differences, of course. So this one, GRX 810, is lighter than GRX 400, so that's going to contribute to the overall lighter weight of our bike, which is a bonus. But for me, perhaps the biggest one is that GRX 810 is DI2, so it has electronic shifting, which means it's even faster to shift, takes even less effort, and is even more consistent and it stays that way as well. There's no chance of getting sticky, gritty cables from dust and from mud and things like that. Now, will it make us faster? That's hard to prove. I suspect it will very subtly, but let's face it, Fabian Cancellara used mechanical shifting and he went pretty fast. Although it's got to be said that all pro cyclists using Shimano now are on DI2. Why? Because it feels nicer and it is faster and it does take less effort. But even more important than that for me is the fact that when you remove all the mechanical shifting gubbins from inside the lever body here, you can make it smaller. And that for me is really important. I love a small lever body. I find it more comfortable and I also find it gives me more confidence, particularly when I'm handling technical terrain. Now again, will it make me faster? possibly fractionally, but then a comfy saddle doesn't make you faster compared to an uncomfy saddle, but I would definitely choose one. And for me, Lever Ergonomics is right up there alongside saddle choice. Yes, it's that noticeable. For me, I find a small lever body satisfying every time I ride. And yes, that does sound more dodgy than I thought it would. Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> on our technical loop, the results were as follows. On the aluminium grail with mechanical shifting, Sai completed it in 4 minutes 42 seconds. And I was a bit slower than that, with uh, 5 minutes and 51 seconds. And switching onto the carbon grail with electronic shifting, Sai went quicker, 4 minutes 35 seconds. Whereas I, I was only marginally faster, 5 minutes 49 seconds. We've had a cracking day bombing around in the woods. It's been great fun on these gravel bikes and there are differences between them, but what does it all mean? It's conclusion time. It is. Well, as you say, there are differences between them. We measured it, although we've got to put a big caveat in. It was kind of subjective, isn't it? We're not using power meters. I don't think it would be appropriate to use power meters in this instance, but the fact is, the differences that we did measure against the stopwatch also tallied up with the way we felt about the bikes, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, we were both quicker uh, in both instances on that bike. And I think, it, but not by a large amount. And I think it's a bit like a, a kind of luxury car versus a, a normal car in that, when you get in an Audi or a BMW, you're not gonna get that much faster to your destination, but it just feels nicer. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I think I know what you mean. I don't have the luxury of driving either of those cars, but I can imagine what it feels like <laughs> to, to drive a Beamer or an Audi. But no, certainly when it comes to bikes, I understand what you mean because, yeah, this bike would technically get you to your destination slightly faster, perhaps slightly fresher, a result perhaps of, of the compliance, of the faster shifting, of, of the lighter weight, but yet yeah, actually, the most rewarding part of it wasn't the result against the stopwatch, it was every time you kind of stamp on the pedals or you dive for a corner, those little micro rewards that you constantly get, you do notice the difference and it's particularly contrasting every time you swap between the bikes. Yes, I think being able to swap immediately between them really does highlight it and it's good that we've got that luxury. But when we did the technical thing, the biggest difference I found was, was not the bikes. On the super technical stuff, what held me back was my own ability or lack of. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, the ability to get off your bike quickly, to, to walk for a bit. All right. I think, yeah. But there's also, actually, we've got to say, the super bike is brilliant for gravel riding, of course, but that bike potentially it's better for all round versatility. Yes, I think this one is a more versatile option because I'd be much more comfortable locking this bike up in town because it costs much less money. And also, when, I, when we were on the, the rough stuff, I'd be much more confident about abusing this bike on rough terrain if I owned that one because it is that bit more expensive. I'd be worried about damaging it. 
I'd be worried about you damaging this one as well. I, no, I just, I don't, I don't think you would, but I know what you mean. You have to be able to ride what you can afford to replace. And off-road, that's particularly true because stuff does happen. Now, I guess when it comes to answering our initial questions, can you go faster on the superbike? Yes, you can. Can you go further? Theoretically, you could because of the extra compliance, but I can't imagine a situation where our mid-range bike would cause you to, to finish your ride early. Like I just, I just don't think that would ever happen, but you might be fractionally beaten up when you get there. I guess whether or not it's worth that extra money is entirely down to you, your personal situation and your perception of value. But it's undoubtedly fantastic news that the difference between them isn't a huge chasm, is it? Both bikes are seriously fast, seriously good and seriously good fun. I like the colour of this one better as well. See, I don't. I think this one's great. I like the way it shows off the mud at the end of our day now. It just looks cool. Uh, anyway, that's beside the point. Super interested to hear your thoughts on all of this. You've seen all of our comparisons on the road. Let us know what you think now about this mid-range versus superbike on gravel.